In the very hour that Varda, Lady of the Heavens, rekindled the bright stars above Middle-earth, the children of Eru awoke by the mirror of Kiwi Viennin, the Water of Awakening. These people were the Quendi, who were called Elves, and when they came into being, the first thing they perceived was the light of new stars. So it is that, of all things, Elves love starlight best, and worship Varda, whom they know as Elantari, Queen of the Stars, over all Valar. And further, when the new light entered the eyes of elves in that awakening moment, it was held there, so that ever after it shone from those eyes. Thus Eru, the one whom the elfborn know as Iluvatar, created the fairest race that ever was made and the wisest. Iluvatar declared that elves would have and make more beauty than any earthly creatures. They would possess the greatest happiness and deepest sorrow. They would be immortal and ageless, so they might live as long as the earth lived. They would never know sickness and pestilence, but their bodies would be like the earth in substance and could be destroyed. They could be slain with fire or steel in war, be murdered, and even die of great grief. Their size would be the same as that of men, who were still to be created, but elves would be stronger in spirit and limb, and the elves would not grow weak with age, only wiser and more fair. Though far lesser beings in stature and might than the godlike Valar, Elves share the nature of those powers more than the second-born race of men do. It is said that elves always walk in a light that is like the glow of the moon just below the rim of the earth. Their hair is like spun gold, or woven silver, or polished jet, and starlight glimmers all about them on their hair, eyes, silken clothes, and jeweled hands. There is always light on the elven face, and the sound of their voices is various and beautiful and subtle as water. Of all their arts, they excel best in speech, poetry, and song. Elves were the first of all people on earth to speak with voices, and no earthly creature before them sang. And justly, they call themselves the Quendi, the Speakers, for they taught the spoken arts to all races on earth. In the first age of starlight, after the fall of Utumno and the defeat of Melkor the Dark Enemy, the Valar called the elves to the undying lands of the west. This was before the rising of the sun and the moon when only the stars lit Middle-earth, and the Valar wished to protect the elves from the darkness and the lurking evil that Melkor had left behind. They also wished to have the companionship of these fair folk, and wanted them to live in the everlasting light of the sacred trees of the Valar in Valinor. And so, in the Undying Lands, which lie beyond the seas of the west, the Valar prepared a place named Eldemar, Elvenholm, where it was foretold that in time the elves would build cities with domes of silver, streets of gold, and stairs of crystal. The land would be bountiful with fruit and grain, and the elves would be happy, resourceful, and wealthy. The shores of Eldemar would be strewn with diamonds, opals, and pale crystals that the elves themselves would work for the simple joy of making wondrous objects of beauty. In this way, the elves were first divided, for not all the elven people wished to leave Middle-earth and enter the eternal light of the Undying Lands. At the bidding of the Valar, a great number went to the west, and these were called the Eldar, the people of the stars. But others stayed for love of starlight and were called the Avari, the unwilling. Though they were skilled in the ways of nature and like their kindred were immortal, they were a lesser people. They mostly remained in eastern lands where the powers of Melkor were greater, and so they dwindled. The Eldar were also known as the people of the Great Journey, for they had traveled westward across the pathless lands of Middle-earth toward the Great Sea for many years. Of these elven people, there were three kindred, ruled by three kings. The first was the Vanyar, and Ingwi was their king. The second, the Noldor, with Finwi as their lord. And the third was the Teleri, who were ruled by Elwi Singolo. The Vanyar and Noldor reached Belagir, the Sea of the West, long before the Teleri. And Ulmo, lord of the waters, came to them, and set them on an island that was like a vast ship. He then drew the true hosts over the sea to the Undying Lands, to Eldemar, the place the Valar had prepared for them. The fate of the Teleri was different from their kindred, and they separated into various races. Because the Teleri were the most numerous of all their kindred, their passage was slowest. Many turned back from the journey, and amongst these were the Nandor, the Laquendi, the Sindar, and the Falathrim. Elwi the High King was himself lost, and he remained in Middle-earth. However, most of the Teleri pushed westward, taking Olwi, Elwi's brother, as their king, and they reached the Great Sea. There they awaited Ulmo, 
who at last took them to Eldamar. So it was that most of the Eldar came to the Undying Lands in the days of eternal light, when the trees of the Valar lit all the lands. In that light, the elves were ennobled and grew wise and powerful beyond the imagining of those in mortal lands. Their tutors were the Valar and the Maiar, from whom they learned great skills and untold knowledge. In Eldamar, the Vanyar and Noldor built a great city named Tyrion on the hill of Tuna, while on the shore the Teleri built the Haven of Swans, which in their language was Alqualondi. The cities of the elves were the fairest in all the world, and to compare them in beauty was to compare the silver tree of Telperion to the gold tree of Lorelin. During that time called the Peace of Arda and the Chaining of Melkor, the Eldar grew in body and spirit as the fruit and flower of the trees. They created many objects of great skill and beauty that have never been surpassed, and since the dying of the light shall never again be achieved. In Middle-earth, the Sindar, who were called Grey Elves, through the teachings and the light of Melian the Maya, grew mightier than all other elves in the mortal lands. An enchanted kingdom with great power was made in the wood of Doriath, and it was the greatest kingdom among Eldar who did not see the trees of the Valar. With the help of the dwarves of the Blue Mountains, the Sindar built Menacroth, a mighty city. It was called the Thousand Caves, for it was a city beneath a mountain. Yet it was like a forest hung with golden lanterns. Through its galleries could be heard birdsong and the laughter of crystal water flowing in silver fountains. No fairer city was built by any race in Middle-earth. These were the great ages of the Eldar, both in Middle-earth and in the Undying Lands. Yet this time of peace was fated to end, soon after the release of Melkor. All believed Melkor to have repented of his ways, and he had given much help and wisdom both to the Valar and to the Eldar, but he had secretly instilled strife in the lands. However, for a while the Eldar grew greater still, and it was during this time that Fionor rose among the Noldor and made a work that is named greatest of the deeds of the elves in Arda. The genius of Fionor wrought the Silmarils, Three jewels like diamonds that shone with a flame that was a form of life itself, and shone too with the living light of the trees of the Valar. At this time, the lies that Melkor had spread bore fruit, and there was strife and war. With the great spider Ungoliant, Melkor came and destroyed the trees, and light went out from the Undying Lands forever. During the long night that followed, Melkor stole the Silmarils, and with Ungoliant flew across Helicarax the grinding ice, and returned to Middle-earth and the dark pits of Angband, his great armory. Fionor swore vengeance, and against the will of the Valar, bound the Noldor to his purpose with an oath. The Noldor therefore pursued Melkor to Middle-earth, and doing this they became a cursed people, for they captured the swan ships of the Tillery of Alqualandi, and slew their elven brothers. This was the first kinslaying among elves. With the ships of the Tillery, the Noldor of Finwy crossed Belagare the Great Sea, while the Noldor led by Fingelfin, in an act of great courage, dared to cross the Helicaraxi, the bridge of ice on foot. As the Quinta Silmarillion tells, so began the War of the Jewels, which caused the downfall of the Noldor and Sindar in the lands of Beleriand in Middle-earth. For the Noldor pursued Melkor and made war on his kingdom for all the First Age's son. Melkor they named Morgoth, the dark enemy of the world. The war was bitter and terrible, and of those Eldar who lived in Middle-earth, few survived that struggle, though great deeds were done and mighty kingdoms rose and fell. Finally, the Valar and many Eldar in the Undying Lands came and in the War of Wrath crushed Melgoth the enemy forever. But in that war, Beleriand was destroyed and was covered by the waves of the vast sea. The great kingdoms of that place disappeared forever, as did the elven cities of Menegroth, Nargothrond, and Gondolin. Only one small part of Assyrian, which was named Linden, survived the deluge. There the last Eldar kingdom in Middle-earth remained in the first years of the Second Age of Sun. Most of the Eldar who survived the War of Wrath returned west and were brought by the white ships of the Teleri to Tol Eresia in the Bay of Eldamar. There they built the Haven of Avaloni, including a tower that sent light over the shadowy seas. Meanwhile, those of the second-born race of men who had aided the Eldar against Morgoth went to an island named Numenori in the center of Belagare, the Great Sea. Little is told after that time of those Eldar in the Undying Lands, except that, though the light of the trees had gone, there never was anything on Middle-earth, 
and even its greatest days to compare with the twilight years of Eldamar. The Eldar grow still wiser on the blessed shores, but none have returned to tell the tales of that place and the deeds of those people. Yet still, for a while, some Eldar remained in mortal lands, for their doom was not fulfilled. Some who were great among the Noldor and Sindar had remained. One was Gilgalad, and he was last of the high kings of the Eldar in Middle-earth. His reign lasted as long as the Second Age of Sun, and his kingdom of Linden survived until the Fourth Age. There was peace in the years of the Second Age. The elves again prospered and wandered into the east. Some Noldor and Sindar lords joined the Sylvan elves and made themselves kingdoms. Thranduil made Greenwood the Great his woodland realm, and Celeborn and Galadriel ruled Lothlorien, the Golden Wood. In that age, the greatest of the Eldoran colonies was Eregion, which men named Holland, where many great nobles of the Noldor went. As a people, they were named the Gwaith e Myrdain, but in later days they were called the Elvensmiths. And it was to these people that Sauron the Maya, greatest servant of Morgoth, came in disguise. Celebrimbor, the greatest elven smith of Middle-earth, and grandson of Fëanor, who made the Silmarils, lived in Holland. At his order, and with his skill, the rings of power were made, and because of them and the one ring that Sauron forged, the war of Sauron and the elves was waged, and many other wars, both in that age and the next. The evil battles of Sauron's war was terrible. Celebrimbor perished, and his land was ruined, and Gilgalad sent Elrond and many warriors from Linden to the aid of the people of Eregion. Those elves who survived the destruction of Eregion fled to Imlogis, which in the Third Age was called Rivendell, and hid from the terror, and they took to their lord Elrond Hathelven. But though the elves were not strong enough to break the power of the Dark Lord as long as he held the One Ring, their allies, the Numenorians, had grown mighty in the west, and even by the reckoning of elves were godlike in power, though they were but mortals. The Numenorians came in their ships to Linden, and drove Sauron from the lands of the west. In a later time still, they came again, and to the amazement of the world, they captured the Dark Lord himself, and in chains took him to their lands. Even in defeat, the Dark Lord Sauron was filled with cunning, and steed by treachery he achieved what he never could in war. The Echelabeth tells how the Numenorians were deceived by Sauron, and a terrible doom fell on them. All the lands in Numenori were swallowed by the Sea of Belagare, and all but a chosen few of that race vanished from the earth forever. The change of the world also occurred, and at that time the undying lands of Valinor and Eldamar were removed from the circles of the world. Mortal lands became closed in on themselves, and the undying lands were set apart. They were unreachable except by the white elven ships that still sailed by what was named the Straight Road, which reached beyond the spheres of the mortal world to that undying blessed shore. But in that second age of sun there was still Sauron, Lord of the Rings, to deal with for he had escaped the downfall in Numenor and had returned to his kingdom of Mordor. Therefore the last alliance of elves and men were made, and all who were great among Eldor and Numenorian made war on the Ring Lord. They broke Mordor and Baradur, his tower, and took his ring from him. He and her servants perished and went into the shadows, but Gilgalad, the last high king of the elves in Middle-earth, was also killed, as were nearly all the great lords of the Numenorians. And again, there was peace for a time, and many Eldar went into the west from the Grey Havens. There still remained a few Eldar to watch over the lands that slowly the race of men were coming to possess. In the Third Age, the Eldar in Middle-earth were but a shadow of their former presence. Linden remained, but soon mostly apart from the strife of Middle-earth, and Círdan, lord of the Grey Havens, was held highest among them. East of the Blue Mountain, the Eldar ruled only the lands of Lothlorien, the Goldenwood, Imlidris, which was called Rivendale, and the woodland realm of Greenwood, which is renamed Mirkwood. All of these were in some way hidden and kept apart from the world of men. The concerns of elves seemed largely their own in all but one matter, that of the Lord of the Rings, who came to Mordor once again and sent his servants, the Nazgul, over all the land. Then the elves and the descendants of the Numenorians once more fought in that which is called the War of the Ring. The One Ring in that time was destroyed, Mordor fell again, and finally, and Sauron vanished forever, as did his servants, and his hold on all evil in the world was broken. However, the power of the Ring was also bound to the power of the Eldar in mortal lands, 
and when the one ring was unmade, the glory of the Eldar faded. The ring bearers and many of the kin were then called to the undying lands. In the fourth age, in the time of the dominion of men, the last of the Eldar sailed the last white ship that Tyrden of the Grey Havens made out upon the straight road. And thus these people of the stars passed away forever to that place beyond the reach of mortals, save an ancient tale, and perhaps in dream. Within the deepest pits of Autumno, in the first age of stars, it is said Melkor committed his greatest blasphemy. For in that time he captured many of the newly risen race of elves and took them to his dungeons, and with hideous acts of torture he made ruined and terrible forms of life. From these he bred a goblin race of slaves who were as loathsome as elves were fair. These were the orcs, a multitude brought forth in shapes twisted by pain and hate. The only joy of these creatures was in the pain of others, for the blood that flowed within orcs was both black and cold. Their stunted form was hideous, bent, bow-legged, and squat. Their arms were long and strong as the apes of the south, and their skin was black as wood that had been charred by flame. The jagged fangs in their wide mouths were yellow, their tongues red and thick, and their nostrils and face were broad and flat. Their eyes were crimson gashes, like narrow slits and black iron grates behind which hot coals burn. These orcs were fierce warriors, for they feared more greatly their master than any enemy, and perhaps death was preferable to the torment of orcish life. They were cannibals, ruthless and terrible, and often their rending claws and slavering fangs were gored with the bitter flesh and the foul black blood of their own kind. Orcs were spawned as thralls of the Master of Darkness. Therefore, they were fearful of light, for it weakened and burned them. Their eyes were night seeing, and they were dwellers of foul pits and tunnels. In Melkor's Autumno, and in every foul dwelling in Middle-earth, they multiplied. More quickly than any other being of ardor, their progeny came forth from the spawning pits. At the end of the first age of stars was the War of the Powers, in which the Valar came to Autumno and broke it open. They brought Melkor with a great chain, and destroyed Melkor's servants in Autumno, and with them most of the orcs. Those who survived were masterless and went wandering. In the ages that followed were the great migrations of the elves, and though orcs lived in the dark places of Middle-earth, they did not appear openly, and the elven histories speak not of orcs until the fourth age of stars. By this time, the orcs had grown troublesome. Out of Angband they came in armor of steel plate and linked chains, and helmets of iron hoops and black leather, beaked like hawk or vulture with steel. They carried scimitars, poison daggers, arrows, and broad-headed swords. This brigand race with wolves and werewolves dared in the fourth age of stars to enter the realm of Beleriand, where the Sindarin kingdom of Melian and Thingol stood. The Grey Elves knew not what manner of beings the orcs were, though they did not doubt they were evil. As these elves did not use steel weapons at the time, they came to the dwarf smiths of Nagrod and Belagost and bartered for weapons of tempered steel. Then they slaughtered the orcs and drove them away. Yet when Melkor returned to Beleriand in the last age of stars, out of the pits of Angband the orcs came, rank upon rank, legion upon legion, in open war. And this was the beginning of the wars of Beleriand. For in the valley of the Wither Gillian they were met by Thingol's grey elves and Denethor's green elves. In this first battle, the orcs were decimated and driven shrieking in flight to the Blue Mountains, where they found no refuge but only the axes of the dwarves. None of that army escaped. Yet Mark Melkor had sent forth three grand armies. The second army overran the western lands of Beleriand and besieged the Phallus, but the cities of the Phalathrim did not fall. So the second army of orcs joined the third army and marched north to Mithrim, where they thought they might entrap and slay the newly arrived Noldoran elves. But the orcs were little prepared for these elves, and strength of body that Noldor were far beyond the darkest dreams of the orcs. The eyes of these elves alone seared the flesh of the orcs, and the fierce light of elven swords drove them mad with pain and fear. So the second battle of Beleriand was fought against the Noldor, whom Fionor led, and this battle was called the Battle Under Stars, the Dagar Nuin Gileath. And though the Noldor king Fionor was slain, the second and third armies of Melkor were entirely destroyed. A second Noldor army came, led by the Lord Fingolfin, came out of the west, and the great light of the sun mounted the ramparts of the sky as if it was a great shout that brought fear to every servant of Melkor. So the first age of sun began, 
and for a time the orcs were checked by the new light of the sun. However, soon under cover of darkness, orcs came in yet another grand army, more numerous than the other three, and more heavily armed, hoping to catch the Noldor unaware. In the glorious battle, the orc legions were slaughtered again. At this time, the siege of Angband had begun, and though orcs at times sallied forth in bands, for the most part they were held within Angband's walls. Yet Melkor's might grew, for by dark sorcery he bred more of the orc race, and also the race of dragons, and about him were balrogs, trolls, werewolves, and monsters many and great. When he deemed himself ready, the mighty host came into the battle of the sudden flame, and this broke the siege of Angband, and the elven lords were defeated. From this mighty battle is counted the reign of terror that the orcs remember as the Great Years. At that time, Tall Syrian fell, and the kingdoms of Hithlam, Mithrim, Dor Loman, and Dorthanion were overrun. The Battle of Unnumbered Tears was also fought. This was the fifth battle in the Wars of Beleriand, and the elves in Adain were completely defeated. The evil orc legions of Angband then marched into Beleriand. The phallus fell to the orcs as did both the seas of Berthombar and Elgarist. The Battle of Thumhalad was fought and Nargothrand was sacked. Because of disputes with dwarves in the Noldor, Menegroth was twice overrun and the Great Elf lands were ruined. Finally, Gondolin, the Hidden Kingdom, fell. So Melkor's victory was all but complete. His orc legions went wherever they wished in Beleriand. All the elven kingdoms were ruined. No great city stood and the lords and the greatest part of the elves in Edain were slain. Such is the tale of days that are joyful to the black hearts of the orcs. Yet the terror of that age finally came to an end, for the Valar, the Maiar, the Vanyar, and the Noldor of Tyrion all came out of the Undying Lands, and the Great Battle was joined. In it, Angban was destroyed, and all the monsters of the north were broken. Beleriand with Angban fell into the boiling sea. Melkor was cast out into the void forevermore, and his servants, the orcs, were exterminated in the north. Still, the orcs survived, for in the east and the south part of the race lay hidden in foul dens beneath dark mountains and hills. There they bred and multiplied. Eventually, they came to Melkor's general Sauron, offering their services, and he became their new master. In the Second Age of Sun, they served Sauron well in the War of Sauron and the Elves, and in all his battles until the War of the Last Alliance, when the Age ended with the fall of Mordor, and with most of the orcish race again being exterminated. Yet in the Third Age of Sun, as in the Second, those orcs hidden in dark and evil places lived on. Masterless, the orcs raided and ambushed for many centuries, but made no grand schemes of conquest until more than a thousand years of the Age had passed. When, as a great and evil eye, Sauron reappeared in the dark realm of Dol Guldor in southern Mirkwood. As in the Second Age, the dark destinies of Sauron and the Orcs were again made one, and for two thousand years of the Third Age, Orcish power increased with that of their Dark Lord. Their power first grew in Mirkwood near Dol Guldor, then in the Misty Mountains. In 1300, the Nazgul reappeared in Mordor, in the realm of Angmar in northern Eriador, and the Orcs flocked to them. After 600 years of terror, Angmar fell, but the evil realms of Minas Morgul arose in Gondor, and there again the orcs increased with those of Mirkwood, the Misty Mountains, and Mordor for the next thousand years. Yet it was said that Sauron was not fully pleased with his orcish soldiery, and he wished to increase their strength. And though no tale tell of it, it was believed that Sauron through terrible sorcery made a new breed of greater orcs. For in the year 2475, those creatures called the Urukai came out of Mordor and sacked Osgiliath, the greatest city of Gondor. These Urukai were orcs grown to the height of men, yet straight-limbed and strong. Though they were truly orcs, black-skinned, black-blooded, lynx-eyed, fanged, and claw-handed, Urukai did not languish in sunlight and did not fear it at all. So the Urukai could go wherever their evil brethren could not, and being larger and stronger, they were also bolder and fiercer in battle. Clad in black armor, often carrying straight swords and long yew bows, as well as many of the evil and poisoned orc weapons. The Urukai were made elite men at arms, and more often were the high commanders of captains of the lesser orcs. In the centuries that follow, the Urukai and the lesser orcs grew still greater in power, and made alliances that they might ruin all the kingdoms of men and elves that were in the Westlands. Therefore, the orcs made treaties with the Dunlendings, the Balkoth, the Wainriders, the Haradrim, 
the Easterlings of Rune, and the Corsairs of Umbar to achieve their aim. The Orcs came even to the realms of the Dwarves. In the year 1980, Moria was taken by a mighty Balrog demon. With him he were the Orcs of the Misty Mountains, who had come out of their capital of Gundabad in great numbers to inhabit the ancient Dwarven city, heaping great contempt on the Dwarf people and slaying whoever came near their most ancient realm. Yet in the north this was to be the undoing of the Orcs, for the Dwarves were so enraged that they cared not at all what cost they would have revenge. So it was that from 2793 to 2799, there was waged a seven years war of extermination called the War of the Dwarves and Orcs. In this war, though dearly cost the Dwarves, almost all the Orcs of the Misty Mountains were hunted out and slain. And at the East Gate of Moria, the terrible Battle of Azanobizar was fought. The Orcs were destroyed, and the head of the Orc general, Azog, was impaled on a stake. So it was that for a century the Misty Mountains were clean to this foul race, yet in time they returned to Gundabad in Moria. In the year 2941, a second great disaster befell the orcs in the north. After the defeat of the dragon Smaug, all the orc warriors of Gundabad came to the dwarf realm of Erebor, and the Battle of Five Armies was fought beneath the Lonely Mountain. The orcs were led by Bolg of the north, son of Azog, and he wished to have vengeance on the dwarves, but all he achieved was his own death and that of all of his warriors. In the War of the Ring, the last great conflict of the Third Age of Sun, the Orgish legions were everywhere, as the Red Book of Westmarch relates. From the Misty Mountains and the Shadows of Mirkwood, the Orcs came to war under banners both black and red. Fearless Urukai with shields and helmets carrying the emblem of the White Hand came out of Isengard, where the rebel wizard Saruman ruled. In Morgul, both great and lesser Orcs were marked with a white moon like a great skull. And under Sauron's command were the countless Orcs of Mordor, of whatever breed, who were marked with the symbol of the Red Eye. All of these prepared for war, and many others as well. They fought numerous skirmishes and ambushes, as well as the battles of the Fords of Isen, the Battle of the Hornburg, the Battle of Pelennor Fields, the Battle Under the Trees, and the Battles of Dale. In these assaults, thousands on both sides fell, and though in many of these battles the orcs were utterly vanquished, it is told that Sauron held back the greater part of his force within Mordor until the enemy came to the northern gateway of his realm. All was to be resolved in this one last battle before Moranon, the Black Gate. All the dreadful forces of Mordor were gathered there, and at Sauron's command they fell on the army of the Captains of the West. However, at that very moment, in the volcanic fires of Mount Doom, the one ring of power which held all Sauron's dark world in sway was destroyed. The Black Gate and the Black Tower burst asunder. The mightiest servants of Sauron were consumed in fire. The Dark Lord became black smoke dispelled by a west wind. The orcs perished like straw before flames. Though no doubt some orcs survived, they never again rose in great numbers, but dwindled and became a minor goblin folk possessed of but a rumor of their evil ancient power.